Uh, lastly, I'd like my board, my Broadneck Council board, to stand up and just to acknowledge these people have done their yeoman's job. of this board are members of the Bay Bridge Reconstruction Advisory Group. So we are there with folks like him trying to fight for a better solution to our Bay Bridge traffic. Uh, hopefully we'll see some improvements. The agenda for tonight, for Kim's agenda, uh, she's going to talk about the service road options that have been delineated by state highways and some of them were discussed by Tim Smith when he spoke to the uh, Broadneck House, the Broadneck uh, community on February 24th. Okay, then uh, Kim is going to talk about the survey results that were collected by uh, Tim Smith, and that is uh, all the, there were over a thousand uh, sent in. Some of them were bogus, like as I told you at the last meeting, their return address was Croatia. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of through this way. And so you'll hear the survey results. Everybody wants to close the ramps on Oceanic, et cetera. And we have some federal laws that we have to obey, which you'll hear about. We talked about it several times, but we'll talk about it again. Uh, there's some more data that was collected. And finally, uh, we will talk about the pilots that we are all aware about that were uh, in effect on the first two weekends in August of this year where we did have a traffic light at Oceanic. We've seen some positives on that that may be extended next year. We may even have more traffic lights at more ramps. Uh, they at State High is looking at everything they can in order to use that technology since it has been affected some. Uh, talking about Kim, Kim is one of our own. She grew up in Animal County. She is currently the District 5 Traffic Engineer for traffic ops and safety. She has 26 years experience. She has a undergrad and a graduate degree in civil engineering from the University of Maryland. Uh, and she covers Anne Arundel County, Calvert County, Charles County, and St. Mary's County. So her reach is extensive. Her experience is big long years. And I'm very happy to introduce Kim Prince. Thanks, Pat. Good evening, everybody. Apologize for the technical difficulties. This is a little bit not what I was expecting. We brought uh, redundancies in everything except the projector. And unfortunately, that's the oldest piece of the, all the equipment. So that's the one that didn't work. <laughs> so we're working on that. So we'll see if we get one further along. So um, at the end of the presentation, though, eventually I understand that it will be uh, online where they can see it. It will be posted on your site or? Right? Yeah. Okay. And then you guys will be able to, to see that along with uh, yeah. the video of, of this recording to go along with it. Yeah. But um, just to start a little bit, again, I want to thank you all for inviting us out tonight. Uh, we have an extensive team at State Highway. Many of you were here back in February on the 24th when Tim was here and presented. Uh, many of those same folks are here with me tonight. Uh, have, I'm the district engineer at State Highway for District 5. Karen Fiasco is our deputy district engineer. Jason Decembre is with our Office of Chart in Otmo. Um, Hillary Gonzalez is special assistant to the administrator, who also has a lot of experience here with us in District 5. And Ron Ergott is our, AD, our head of the, traffic, of the construction division in District 5. And our community liaison person in the back is Kelly Bulware. Um, apologize if I miss anyone. And soon, our IT guy will be coming, hopefully, with another projector. <laughs> so in the meantime, uh, we'll talk you through it. The good news is it's a lot of data, and you didn't probably want to look at it anyway. I'll probably talk you through it a little easier than looking at a bunch of lines on a, on a graph, right? So, um, so again, as Pat already said, we want to talk about a few things tonight. I want to give you an overview of the survey. So sort of where Tim left off in February was here are these three options. I'm going to talk about them again. And then we had this survey, and everybody went online to answer the survey. And we want to talk about what were the results of that survey, and then based on that, what did we decide to do next and try next that we implemented over the summer, and go through the data and you know, what the data showed, and then what we could glean from it, and then next steps of, of what we hope to do moving forward from that.
Okay, so when Tim presented this back in February, he talked about three options that we could do out there and ask for you guys to give input on the survey. Basically, and I understand at the time it was somewhat um, nebulous or abstract, and unfortunately without my pretty pictures, it continues to be nebulous and abstract, but he had what he described as near-term improvements, something that could be implemented within like one to two years that would be uh, operational type improvements on the service roads. So we're talking about things like possibly just resurfacing the roads, which gives you a clean slate to then be able to restripe it in some other way. Knowing that we don't have a lot of pavement to work with, it's not like we can do many different configurations of the lanes out there, but possibly would there be the opportunity to do something out there. There's been a lot of interest in the community for not only what's been going on during the reach the beach traffic, gridlocking the neighborhoods, but also just in general about pet and bike safety on the corridor and things like that. So will we have an opportunity to make something a little bit better out there in either or both of those regards? Um, in the midterm option, which was something that maybe would be implemented in like three to five years, talked about more traffic calming. So in the, in the first option, it was maybe analyze some ideas of traffic calming. And then in the midterm, could we actually implement some of them? Some of those types of things might be like at an intersection um, connection to the, say, East College Parkway at Revel Downs or something, could it turn into a roundabout? Or could there be some traffic calming or some sort of chokers or bump outs? Some of this might be for pedestrian or bicycle safety. Maybe it would help slow traffic. You know, um, could we implement anything that would maybe slow the traffic down and put them in sort of what we call a chicane? Maybe, maybe with either flex posts or the way we stripe the road that it's not just a straight shot anymore and the traffic now is calmed because it has to go into a curve. And my beautiful pictures that I will show you later, um, we have an example of that up uh, heading on 173, heading into the Fort Smallwood Park. And unfortunately, they actually were dealing with like drag racing in the middle of the night and things like that. And we did something like that with our shop folks and they put that stuff out there to just calm the traffic. So again, when Tim was presenting these back in February, it was just sort of a myriad of ideas of what could be done. We, we hadn't fully vetted any of them yet. It was just to get an idea from you folks. What, what do you want to see us maybe try to tackle or try to, what's the most important thing for us to move forward with? And these are just some different ideas. Um, in the long term, which would take probably more than five years, it was looking at things like greater geometric improvements and maybe implementing even a system of maybe one-way segments on the service roads to try to curtail people from using it as a, a shortcut all the way down to Oceanic to jump back on. And I'll, and I'll jump forward to a lot of the comments and things that came in the survey people didn't really understand, well, where, which segments were going to be which direction. And thing. We, we hadn't really vetted all that out yet. It was just being thrown out there as a basic idea. Could this be something that we should analyze further? Would it be something that would be helpful if certain portions of either the northern or the southern service road was one way eastbound or the other one was one way westbound? And instead of one lane each way, you now have enough pavement for one lane and now shoulders or a protected bike lane or something like that. You could sort of repurpose some of that pavement if you did that. Um, so that being said, those, those were the three options. And, and the, initially, we had about 232 respondents to the survey. And then later, as Pat said, well over 1,000. A lot of people then answered later and were giving their own, you know, free type in their own suggestions of, well, what are the other types of ideas? I don't necessarily like any of those three, so here's my idea. So we had a lot of that as well. But in that initial 232 respondents, for the short-term improvements, just repave the road, maybe restripe, maybe lower the speed limit, we still had more than half of the folks that said, like 54% that said no to that, and you know, more than 45% said yes. We don't know if it's because they didn't exactly know the details of what we were suggesting or if they just really were against it. So we can't really tell that from the way the survey was. In the midterm, um, going to maybe some more traffic calming, possibly a roundabout, maybe building a chicane like I was talking about, those types of things. So we had a bigger no. So the no was now into uh, almost 
And then when we got to the long-term concept of a potentially one-way segments and things like that, it was um, nearly 75% that said no to that. So, and again, you know, we don't, we don't know. Part of it was, again, it hadn't been fully, you know, vetted or, you know, explained exactly what it was. But just from the initial gut feeling of that idea, most of the people were saying no. And we got lots of suggestions of things that they wanted us to try. And so the things that they were talking about in their comments, a lot of different people said two main themes. Some additional signing on the main line that would maybe help encourage people to stay on 50. And then the other big theme was, could you do something to the on and or off ramps to either close them or somehow control them or meter them. Or I think even during that meeting that night, somebody suggested like a ramp signal, like a ramp meter type of thing. So a lot of people made those types of comments. So after hearing those suggestions, those are two of the things that we tried to move forward with in a, for the summer. We wanted to do something that we could actually get done and installed before Memorial Day weekend. And that was the stay on US 50 signage that, that we installed. And that was actually on both shores. So we overall, we designed, fabricated, and installed with our maintenance forces like 29 signs. A lot of them are on the eastern shore, you know, coming back westbound, telling those folks to stay on 50 as well. Ken Island, you know, dealing with their own issues over there. But eight of them went in in Anne Arundel County. So along southbound Ritchie Highway, somewhere before you get to College Parkway. We used to have a um, portable VMS sign, digital message board, that would say, you know, how many miles and how many minutes to the Bay Bridge. And we also had suggestions that pe some people may be seeing that and it's encouraging them to jump off and use College Parkway. It, what it's saying is if you stay on Ritchie Highway and then get on Route 50, it's this many miles and this many minutes. And when it would say, you know, if it's 10 miles and 10 minutes, most people figure out, all right, we're doing 60 miles an hour. That's good. If it's 10 miles and 50 minutes, that's a snail's pace. So then they decide to try to divert, right? So we were asked, could you, like, get rid of that sign because you're encouraging people to use College Parkway? So we got rid of that sign, you know, before the summer, and we installed a static sign, right? It's white on green. It looks like a guide sign. And then one panel of it is black on yellow, like a warning sign. And it basically just says, Bay Bridge, follow... Route 2, it's got a little symbol. And then it says in black and yellow, local access on College Parkway. So it's trying to tell people stay on the main route. Likewise, we have some on Route 50. We have some on the service roads themselves. On the service roads, they say like local access ahead. Bay Bridge East, use 50. So it's telling you, hey, go get back on 50. Don't continue on this service road. So again, on the Anne Arundel side, we put in like eight signs and they were all installed before uh, Memorial Day weekend. And so we wanted to move forward with this idea of somehow controlling or managing uh, a, a ramp. And so the easternmost ramp, Oceanic, Oceanic, which is where Sandy Point is, right? I know you're all very familiar. We had an idea of putting a portable signal at the bottom of the ramp, and it would manage the flow of traffic. So if you were on one of the service roads and you got all the way down to Oceanic, and you want to jump back on to eastbound 50, now at the bottom of this loop ramp, you're going to sit at the signal and, and wait. And so two things that we hoped that it would maybe achieve. Earlier, last summer, we had a lot of traffic data that had been collected and things. Mainly we were looking at coming out of the pandemic and was the summer of 21 going to be the better than the summer of 2020 and stuff. So we had a lot of data for Reach the Beach. And we used that data to run some models uh, traffic models. And what it showed was, hmm, if you could limit how much traffic is coming in, right, at the merge point, it sort, of, sort of reduces that friction of traffic trying to get into the main line, maybe the main line would run more smoothly. And in the model, it showed that it would. And from what we know about ramp metering and things, like it's kind of the concept behind ramp metering. So, so okay, well, maybe we could expand on this and see would it improve the flow on Route 50? That would help keep people from jumping off onto the service roads. But then also, would it cause enough delay to those who did jump off and use the service roads that a lot of these um, apps like Waze and Google Maps and stuff, maybe it wouldn't route them there anymore if, they, if it showed 
this is backed up. So we had kind of two things in mind that we wanted to collect data, see what it did, and how did it react. So we actually, um, we actually scheduled to be collecting a lot of data over five different weekends. So we had three weekends without the ramp signal, sort of before conditions, and we did that over Memorial Day weekend, and then the next weekend, which was the first weekend in June. But school, not all the schools are out yet. It is kind of summer, but it's not full-blown summer yet. So then we also did it the weekend of July 8th, uh, Saturday is the 9th, because that's sort of a normal summer weekend that's not necessarily a holiday, and just see we collected a lot of traffic data. And then I'll get into later, then we collected all of that same type of data when the ramp signal was in effect for those two weekends, the first two weekends in August. So when we first started collecting data without the ramp signal, the before data, Memorial Day weekend, we only looked at it Friday and Saturday. And if those of you around here, you know Friday of Memorial Day weekend is Naval Academy graduation. Uh, there's a lot going on, right? Reach the beach traffic. And then, so we did Friday and Saturday, first weekend in June, Friday and Saturday. That weekend in July, we said, hey, maybe we should add Sunday as well and see what's going on Sunday. So then when we moved to the pilot weekends of, of the ramp signal, the first two weekends in August, we actually collected data Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, because that signal was operating all four of those days. The types of data they collected, and we had a whole team, and we had a lot of uh, support and, and help from our Travel Forecasting Analysis Division, TFAD. Their consultants and their staff was out collecting data. Jason's folks from um, CHART, right? So we had um, travel time runs on Route 50 and on several different potential diversion routes that we had determined, right? So basic travel time routes coming down Ritchie Highway from about Jones Station Road down and then all the way across Route 50 to Oceanic. That was kind of our stop point to be constant with everybody. How long does it take you to get to Oceanic or get out of the ramp signal, right, at Oceanic? So coming down Ritchie Highway from Jones Station onto Route 50 all the way over to Oceanic, travel time runs, and then a couple diversion routes. And I'll get into those later. And then we also had tube counts where we were counting traffic on the ramps. We had video set up. Some of you may have seen like little video cameras at some of the ramps and intersections. Um, they were able to get dash cam. We had um, field observations. Folks were out and about just watching what was going on, photos, video. We were also reviewing the speed and congestion data that comes out of what they call INRIX. That is kind of like collected data that comes from anybody who happens to be using their cell phone apps while they're driving. doesn't identify who you are, but it kind of source, sources that data and pings it and says, okay, some vehicle took this long to get from here to there and is how fast they were going. So all that data comes in. Um, also took a look at our closed caption TV cameras that we have through our chart systems. We could see where backups were or maybe what's going on, why is there a backup. We did see incidents and different things out there that kind of explained some of the backups and what was going on. Um, our digital, we have overhead digital message signs and then we have some portables that we communicate to. So we were monitoring what kind of messages we were putting on those. And then um, with the Bay Bridge, with MDTA, we we're also monitoring when they had their contraflow lane open. So we all know that we only have two lanes going eastbound to the eastern shore unless they open that third lane on the westbound span. So when they go in and out of contraflow, which isn't always just time of day. I mean, sometimes they can't do it if it's because of weather, incidents, different things, wind. So we also were looking at ways and, Google, and the Google Maps app to see at this point and what's going on, what is it recommending as a diversion route or is it? So we were constantly monitoring what was it telling folks to do. If I was pretending I was going from here to here, where would it tell me to go? Um, so we had some trends. So over those first three weekends before we had the ramp signal, we had some trends that we were looking at and the traffic conditions varied significantly from day to day and really even from hour to hour. So we had long periods of severe congestion with um, significant numbers of vehicles diverting everywhere. But then we also had long periods of free flow on Route 50 and virtually no diversions. So we were able to calculate what we would call the average travel time. You know, for instance, that route that I told you, down Route 2 and across Route 50, what's the average travel time? 
but the average, if you got that average, there was a very high standard deviation because there was such wild swings in what was going on. So kind of a small sample size and data points that are all over the place. See them <laughs> on my graph? Um, but anyway, so but we have an average, and you know what that means, right? It's data, so you take what you want from it. Um, in that before condition, I had some photos of just on oceanic, a, you know, coming on oceanic and trying to get onto the loop ramp to get back on Route 50. And sometimes it was free and clear, and sometimes it's a whole queue of traffic waiting to get on, right? And then under that, I coupled that with the Google map image of, if all, any of you are familiar with it, your route is green, but if it starts to be yellow or red, that's a lot of delay. So obviously, a bunch of cars queued in front of you, correlated with a whole lot of red on your Google map, right? So um, what it showed in the before condition, if you look at two different Fridays, so Naval Academy graduation, Friday of uh, Memorial Day weekend, and then the Friday, the very next weekend, the first weekend in June. And we look at the same time, like 2 p.m. on both of those Fridays, and they were wildly different. And it had to do with um, whether or not the contraflow was in effect on the Bay Bridge. And so sometimes that's because of weather, sometimes that's because of an incident. So if they c couldn't have a third eastbound lane, you had a lot of backup on 50, Therefore, you had a lot of people diverting, and then you had a lot of congestion on, for instance, Oceanic. Therefore, also the uh, East College Parkway and Skidmore. Friday of the second week, it, it, so anyway, in, on the Friday of the first week, it was like you had a backup at 2 o'clock. All of a sudden, by 3.45, it was gone. And that was because they opened the contraflow and things, at 3.15, and things finally dissipated, right? And so all this backup and diversions into your neighborhood sort of dissipated. The Friday of the second weekend was exactly the opposite. Two o'clock was free and clear, but by 3.45 there was backups. Um, and that was because they had, uh, lost myself in my notes. Yeah, they had gridlock on Oceanic at 3.45 because yeah, the contraflow got halted at 3.15 because of an incident. So again, what it showed us was the diversions onto the community roads had more to do with whether or not that contraflow was in effect. Than, than it did the overall volume that's trying to get to the beach. Um, on the third weekend, so this weekend, July 8th weekend, the Satur Saturday that we had like storms and wind advisories, they were not able to open the contraflow the entire day. And so the congestion just increased steadily throughout the day and it was made worse by incidents along Route 50. And so that day honestly was somewhat of a disaster. Um, significant diversions, you guys know the story, you've lived it. So again, when weather and incidents, and that was controlling what the Bay Bridge could do, and then that was affecting what was happening in, in, your, in your area. Um, repeating myself here, let's see. Sundays, so Sundays were a little bit more predictable. So Sundays, they always have three lanes coming back home westbound. So you can only have two lanes going eastbound. But there is still significant volume. A lot of people, I guess, have rentals down there that are Sunday to Sunday or something. So there's still significant volume going Sunday. So congestion was caused when the traffic demand, trying to go over the bridge, exceeded that two-lane capacity of the bridge. And that was pretty consistent each of those five weekends that from like 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., that's when things were building and getting worse and worse. But the overall magnitude of like queues, delays, diversions onto your local roads, is not quite as bad as a Friday or a Saturday when you don't have contraflow. That's, that's your Armageddon. So um, that's sort of what we found from the before condition, those three weekends, okay? So then we moved into the two August weekends where we implemented the ramp signal. And what that was was actually just a portable signal that we rented. We put that at the bottom of the loop ramp right before you're gonna merge in to eastbound 50 had to apply a temporary stop line there. We had Maryland State Police out there with us to a few troopers in the area actually to look at a few of the other interchanges as well, but he was there controlling that. Our signal tech had to be there. It had to put that into the cabinet and control it manually. We didn't really have communication to do it remotely. So if anything needed to be changed, they were gonna have to do it there on site. Um, the ramp signal was only allowing one vehicle per green, and that was every 30 seconds. 
So there was only two vehicles per minute that was getting out of that ramp. Um, we uh, did some fancy calculating, which was called, uh, I think this will work. <laughs> and we thought that's, that's gonna, it's going to do two things. It's going to be severe enough that we have drastically reduced the friction of oncoming traffic into Route 50. So if it's gonna make any kind of travel time savings on Route 50, we should see it. And then it's gonna severely back up probably these service roads um, maybe the apps won't route you there. And so that was the things that we wanted to see what, what would happen. During the first weekend, and any of you who are interested enough to look at it when it finally gets online, so we had travel time runs. We had what I said before, just going down Route, 50, going down route 2, Ritchie Highway, and across Route 50. Um, that was eight and a half miles. And we labeled that on a map as the green route, right? That's the main route you're supposed to stay on. Then we had what we called the northern diversion, which was come down Ritchie Highway, go down College Parkway to East College Parkway. So now you're on the northern service road. You're going to take that all the way down past Sandy Point, you know, to Oceanic and try to get on using the ramp signal um, at Oceanic. That was the northern diversion. Then the southern diversion, these are all people who are coming down Ritchie Highway. They come down Ritchie Highway, they get on Route 50, but then they jump off at um, Bush's Frontage and they get onto the southern service road and they take Skid, um, yeah, they take uh, Whitehall. Whitehall and Skidmore all the way over to Oceanic and then try to enter using the ramp signal. So those were the three routes and then we were comparing the travel time of those routes. And, um, during the periods of low congestion, overall congestion, the total travel times if you stayed on Route 50 were generally slightly shorter than if you took the northern or southern route. It's a freeway, right? So in general, you can just drive a little bit faster than you could on these service roads. Um, but with congestion, the total travel times on Route 50, right, if you stayed on the main line and it was all backed up, instead of taking 10 to 15 minutes to do it, it would take you maybe 30 to 40 minutes to do it. This was uh, looking at the first weekend, and I, and I have graphs here that show Thursday, and then Friday, and then Saturday, and Sunday. And for each hour of the day, all three of those routes are on the same graph, and you can see at any time of the day which route was faster and how much slower this route was, right? And so if you stayed on 50, um, at some point of the day, it took you 40 minutes instead of 15, right? And, but if you were to get onto the southern diversion route um, because of that signal at Oceanic, what normally would be about 15 minutes to do that diversion route took in some cases up to like almost two hours, like 110 minutes. <coughs> People were in it. They were doing it. Um, and then on the northern route, instead of 15 to 20 minutes, it again got up to where it was about 110 minutes. During the peak congestion, generally the US 50 route had total travel times that were shorter than if you got off on either of these diverted routes, yet people still did it, and then they were stuck in it. Um, that was the week one. So then we move into week two, and I'll talk a little more about these later, but in week two, same thing, same map, same graphs of data. Um, before the congestion worsened, the total travel time, again, faster to stay on the main route. Once you have congestion, the main line actually was worse. So it was week two was a little bit worse than week one. So instead of taking you 15 minutes to stay on the main line, it was taking you an hour, so 60 minutes. Um, if you went to the southern route, though, instead of uh, 15 minutes, it took you an hour and a half. It took you 90 minutes. And then on the northern route, it was two hours and 20 minutes, 140 minutes. So the, the total travel times on week two were generally longer than week one. Um, there was significant delay for motorists who tried to bypass the mainline traffic and, and get onto uh, the service roads, particularly those who wanted to try to re-enter at Oceanic. Uh, travel time runs and these data that were collected consistently showed that travel times were longer for vehicles that exited 50 and then got back on, um, on either the northern or southern diversion route. So that was taking longer. But most of that extra delay was if they were trying to get all the way down to Oceanic. So 
um, the eastern portions of the service road and on Oceanic. That's where you saw all these long queues. Some motorists would jump off, but then they would rejoin at exit 30 or at exit 31, you know, not go all the way to 32, which is Oceanic. And they still had some travel time savings by doing that. And I'll get into that in a minute, but they could save sometimes up to like 10 minutes if they did that. And so they did. Um, I'll sh well, I won't show you <laughs> in a minute that um, I have some routes that I show on the map where Waze was still recommending diversions. And so, for instance, to in some cases, and this was um, uh, at like 1.45 in the afternoon on the first weekend on August 6th, it never really routed you to go all the way down to Oceanic. It knew, it knew that that's a big queue, but it did know that there were some time savings if you jumped off. So come down Ritchie Highway, go take College Parkway, and then come across over to St. Margaret's and get back on at like exit 30. And that was saving you, um, yeah, via College Parkway, yeah, and get back on at exit 30. And it was saving you like uh, nine minutes. And so it, it, the interesting thing was it routed them to do that because there were some minutes to be saved. And we saw people doing that, getting back on at exit 29 or exit 30. Um, another route, if you were all, never came from Ritchie Highway and you were just on Route 50, you know, maybe from Washington area, coming across Route 50, sent you down, um, sent you down Route 2, or I should say 450, towards the Naval Academy um, Memorial, I mean, to the World War II Memorial, and then down into, and then up St. Margaret's, and then to get back on at like exit 30. So it was sending you all down and through like Annapolis area. And that saved eight minutes then staying on the main line. Uh, another time it was sending people down Ritchie Highway onto Route 50, get off at Bush's Front Road, you know, kind of like our Southern Diversion. And then, um, I'm sorry, get off like where the Red Hot and Blue is at Old Mill Bottom, take that to St. Margaret's and then jump back on at exit 30 or 31. And that saved like 10 minutes. So. The moral of the story was wherever ways, and honestly, these apps are much more sophisticated than what we can tinker with the signal timing, right? So wherever they saw savings to be made, it, 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 it recommended it, and a lot of people took them up on it. And that's what we've been seeing all along, right? Kind of as Tim described, Watt is like water. It just goes wherever it can flow the easiest. Um, at the same time, for those five different weekends, the first three weekends and then the two where we had the ramp signal, I told you we had travel time runs. And we were, look, we were comparing then Route 50, because we did want to see did the pilot signal smooth things on Route 50 and actually improve any of that flow. Um, so I have a graph that shows all of those travel time runs um, compared to each other. Um, on, a, on basically Fridays of each weekend and then throughout the hours of the day. So what a Friday look like. Memorial Day weekend, that Friday, that was the worst because Naval Academy graduation, there were storms, there was tornado warnings, there was all this stuff they never had, you know. So there was a lot of delay. Um, on this graph that you may see later, uh, the two blue lines represent the two pilot weekends. And the average travel time during the pilot was about three minutes faster on uh, week one than it was during those other three weekends where we didn't have the signal. So when we first collected data, we knew how long it took to, to get down Route 50 all the way to the Bay Bridge. Then when we did it with the pilot, the week one, we saw some time savings on Route 50. And we started to think maybe it is smoothing traffic and it made it a little better until we got into week two um, and it didn't really pan out. And also the Saturday, so Friday was a little bit faster. On Saturdays, the travel time was about five minutes slower um, than, than it was in our initial weekends that we collected data. So in general, the travel times were more, again, like I said before, more influenced by weather, whether or not the contraflow lane was open on the bridge, than it even had anything to do with our ramp man management or our pilot weekend. So the overall, there's a table, there's an overall summary of a typical summer weekend and what the average travel time was about 16 minutes and about 28 miles an hour to go on the freeway and get to the oceanic when the pilot uh, signal was in effect that first weekend the average speed was a little faster and it was about 
couple minutes faster. So 14 minutes instead of 16, 31 miles an hour instead of 28. Nominal, right, increase. But that second weekend, it was slower. So, you know, instead of going 31 miles an hour, you're only going like 19. And instead of taking you 14 minutes, it took you like almost 24. And so again, that's an average over the whole time where there's all these swings in the data. Um, so on the service roads itself, and I know a lot of you saw it, and then you could bring up Google Maps and just see the red on the northern service road, on the southern service road, trying to get onto the ramp at Oceanic, sometimes all the way down St. Margaret's. Um, the ramp signal itself it did not necessarily improve the gridlock on the service road, right? Um, even though the apps were not routing you there, people were still doing it. And I don't, we don't know yet whether it's just because they're used to doing it and we're surprised. Mm -hmm. Maybe these are the people that don't use the apps and they just do it every year. But we do know that just doing this two weekends, it didn't, like in week two, it didn't change their behavior. Like having so much backups in week one didn't make them do something different in week two. Um, we also had an incident where on the first weekend on Saturday, just after, just after 12, there was an incident on the main line, sort of right where Oceanic comes in, so right near our ramp signal. And as our cameras were looking at it, we had a couple fire trucks that came up, and they were like blocking a lane on Route 50 and stuff. And so 50 was backing up. And even when the ramp signal finally got its green for one car every 30 seconds, the car couldn't go because the fire truck was sitting there. So the ramp just backed up that much further. What we learned from that afterwards, though, was that we need to have some way to then flush the ramp when the emergency vehicle finally moves out of there. So uh, again, like I said, the signal was only manually controlled. So, and they didn't know what was our protocol for that weekend. Once the fire truck leaves, should we, should we flush this or just let it? So the queue grew that much longer, and then of course it, it took a long time for it to recover and dissipate. Um, driver behavior. So we had a lot of incidents where, for instance, on Skidmore, you know, frankly, people got tired of waiting, right? It literally took more than two hours sometimes. People would get out of their cars, they're standing out of their car because the cars just aren't moving. A lot of cars were doing, you know, their 12-point turns in the middle of the little service road to get the heck out of there and go back west and try to find a place further west to, to get back onto Route 50. So I have some pictures of cars that were trying to do U-turns in the middle of Oceanic, cars that were trying to do U-turns in the middle of Skidmore. Um, some of them, if they were on the southern service road and they did their U-turn on Skidmore, they headed back to that little at-grade exit 31, that little right in, right out. If you're heading away from the Bay Bridge on the service road and you want to get on Route 50 and head towards the Bay Bridge at uh, 31, it's basically almost a U-turn. Um, so we, uh, we actually saw larger vehicles, trucks and things that got stuck too. So we have a picture, it was like a larger box truck that's trying to maneuver what amounts to that U-turn, and they ended up swinging all the way out into like the middle lane of Route 50 to do it. So traffic on Route 50, I mean, which was 28 miles an hour at the time, so, you know, but they all had to move, and, you know, so it was somewhat um, safety concerns and unsafe conditions with just how everyone was jockeying around to get out of the backup. We had, as I said, MSP was out there, and we had officers at some of these other ramps and things also observing and trying to control. We realize now it, it kind of highlighted some things that maybe we already knew about exit 31. We don't really have standard acceleration and deceleration lanes at that interchange. Um, so it, it exposed some deficiencies that we really have at that interchange, and we'll be considering to think about that as we move forward. So that, and again, that's the data, right? And so I'm just telling you a story of what the data showed us. And we were now then trying to glean something from that. What did we learn, right? Um, and be, whatever we learned, what can we do after that? And I'll reiterate kind of some of the themes that I said. So during the first week of the signal, the, the ramp management of that signal, it seemed to have helped reduce the travel time on the main line. Like maybe it smoothed it a little bit. Um, the travel times on the main line, but then they were worse in week two. So we kind of had to throw that out the window and, and, and rethink that. 
Um, again, as we said, the difference had to do with whether the contraflow lane was in effect. Um, the difference in the level of service on Route 50, the, the flow of traffic on Route 50, is more related to the contraflow, which is affected by incidents, weather. So temporary ramp management, for instance, at Oceanic, it was more of a secondary factor. You know, all things being equal it seems to smooth it a little bit. But once things break down, it breaks down everywhere. Um, the local roads saw just significant delays. And so, you know, depending on the conditions and the backups. Drivers, again, like I said, they did not adjust their behavior. So obviously some of these are not the same drivers, right? They go to the beach this weekend. They didn't go the next weekend. So between week one and week two, it's kind of like as, as a population, they didn't really learn their lesson. So they continued to do it in week two. Um, and then, interestingly enough, the Waze app, like I said, it continues to route you if there's even a few minutes of time to be saved. And there are people that will take them up on it. So it routes you all kinds of different ways. So really causing a lot of delay at Oceanic, still routed people a little bit further west, right? Go do all these diversions a little bit west of Oceanic. And now you have additional gridlock on additional roads that are maybe west of where Oceanic is. So again, this was the, the first year where all the toll booths were completely removed. That construction was complete. So we were still kind of learning how much more of a factor this was gonna be moving forward, just this, the flow of traffic on Route 50. So now we're sort of working off of like a new baseline for mainline flow on Route 50 because the toll booths are gone. Um, we also found out that doing anything solely at exit 32 probably isn't going to affect or, or help. So we really need to look at it as a larger system. Um, so moving forward, right, so we're proposing to have future opportunities next season, like next summer, uh, support again from all of our partners, MDTA, MSP, and then we would expand, hopefully, the temporary ramp management to multiple ramps, right? It wouldn't, maybe it wouldn't be just Oceanic, hoping that, and again, a lot of this is, it, it ways wouldn't recognize it as a good thing to divert people. Um, additional data collection, so we only had five weekends, right? And they wildly were different. If we have additional data collection over the whole summer, then we'll be able to get a better understanding of like average travel times and throw out the outlier and get better averages and things like that. But our ultimate goal of trying to improve flow along Route 50 um, by reducing the friction from traffic coming in, it may be a way to help improve the situation a little bit, but not just at that one spot location at Oceanic. It would have to involve multiple ramps. In order to change driver behavior, right, it needs to happen many more times than just two weekends. So for now, and I know you guys, like she said, are looking for the magic bullet, but that's, that's kind of where we are now. That's what we're thinking. You know, we, we looked at it, didn't tell us exactly what we expected to see. Makes sense. Maybe next summer we try this and go from there. So just in time. <laughs> so um, at this point, I guess I will open it up to questions. So I understand that. Um, at the Bragg meeting, it was announced, it was explained that uh, MDOT put a, crafted a question and posed a question to Federal Highway asking again about if we were to limit the use of the service roads to certain people, right? Could you limit the use of the service road and for reasons like extreme congestion? Um, and then if we did, would it affect our ability to get uh, certain types of federal funding. We have like federal safety funds and things. So Federal Highway responded with an official answer and basically said, yeah, you, you cannot limit, you know, who uses your service roads. And then it talks about this formula, this federal formula for our safety funds would be affected if we did such a thing. So that is sort of the answer that affects uh, both sides of the bridge. So that, that was our starting point when we decided to do this as a ramp signal for now, um, where we didn't close it, we just said it was gonna take a while. <laughs> so, okay. yeah, do you wanna move into questions? Yes, ma'am. In my opinion, and I live off of Bayhead Road, 
I think if we were left alone, it, it's something that we adjusted and learned how to live with. When I tried to leave, go to Ocean City on a Saturday afternoon, I knew you had that block. Mm -hmm. And I went out by Wawa. Right. Trying to get on. You went west to come back right east. On there, it took me 40 minutes, what usually takes me 10 minutes to get on the bridge, trying to follow your route. And then my grandchildren work at Sandy Point, mm -hmm. and they live off the Bay Head. It took them an hour yeah. to go to work. And all the people that go to Sandy Point and everything else, you're penalizing all those people. Too. And your one way route, that would be not a good thing either because of fire and police mm -hmm. going one way, that would delay having services that we need. Well, right now they Thank get you. delayed by 40 minutes of traffic anyway. Mm -hmm. So if it's one way and it's not coming, by the service. Yeah. Yes, sir. Quick question. I have 37 years of my career as an engineer. One of the things that I learned in engineering is the first thing we have to do, instead of jumping or tackling the problem, is identify what the problem is. Mm -hmm. well, what I hear in here, and with all the respect I heard, yes, we have this organization that started in 2007, I believe, so. we're in 2022. One of the ideas that they have spoken a lot is building another bridge. And a lot of us are happy, but those 15 years, I'm sure the bridge will be built over here. Uh, I'm concerned about some of the things that I hear because we're talking about, hey, you know, one way of slowing down the traffic. Fine. If what you're finding is traffic that is bumper to bumper, how much more can you slow it down? That is that helping. I heard the comment that you said about what the state highway uh, administration said and whatever. I don't know if any of you guys have come on a Saturday or Sunday from the Eastern Shore. Mm -hmm. In every exit, every exit to go to Main Street, that is the road that goes parallel, there is a police trooper. And there have been cases that they stop you. You try to go over, they'll stop you and say, where are you going? Where are you going? That's your ID. They check your ID. Yeah, yes. yeah, exactly. Yeah. That changed yeah. behavior, and, yeah. and that really does change behavior versus just putting a sign that people are having. And, and, and my concern is that we are looking, and, and, and I appreciate what you guys are doing, but we're looking for a quick fix. But there's some of the things that we can do. I mean, it's like, for me, things like hearing, okay, let's see if we can slow down. I heard the comment that you said, happened in Pasadena, that they had the scenario of street duck racing, fine. In areas that is a parking lot, we mm -hmm. cannot do it. And yes, uh, I work also with I work also with uh, artificial intelligence, and there's a lot of data. Here. And we're talking about the behaviors of the drivers, but in reality, and at the end, we do basically hit the nail on the head. It's not the same people. Right. People that go and go through all that, they go to the ocean like what? Once a year, once a summer, or something like that. The following week is the second. So, yeah, doing all these exercises, good and dandy, but they're not going to give us the solution because we're talking about a different population. Uh, hold on. Yes, sir. Yellow shirt. Yep. Hi. Well, I'm just kind of curious. Speak up, please. please. Speak up, please. I'm just kind of curious. I'm a resident of the Cape, so this is going to be very parochial. I don't see. Bo Breeden here, or Governor Lamb, or many other people. I've lived here for 35 years. These are people I know who are very dedicated and really do worry about this. They actually promoted this meeting. What do they think about this? Let me answer that. Bo Breeden is Vice President of the Broadneck Council. He was unable to come tonight because of a business conflict. We have James Kitchen, who is the Director of Constituent Services. He's representing Stuart Pittman. We have our councilwoman in the back. We have Amanda Fever. She is here. We have our candidate for state government. Uh, state what Senate. does the Cape and St. Clair Improvement and Association think he, about this? These people are here to What support. does the Cape St. Clair Improvement Association think about this? The Cape St. Clair Improvement Association. Amanda Fielder is not a member of the Cape St. Clair Improvement Association. Excuse me. If I can answer the question, I'd be very happy to. Yeah. Well, the Cape St. Clair, so far. Bob Reed is the vice president of the Broadneck Council, and he works with our team to do everything he can to help. 
solve the traffic problems. He is not here tonight because of an engagement, that, a business say? engagement. And he works just as hard as all of us do on what these does traffic he say? problems. Dan? Uh, related to this gentleman's point, um, how come the state police can be at the service road side, the other side of the bridge, and not this side? Does anybody have an answer on that? Different counties, I guess. And is that is that Main Street a, a, a state road? If it's not, then then they can do something different. So I will tell you that. I don't understand. Yeah. It's like it's still government. Mm -hmm. So why is, it, why is it state versus county or local jurisdiction? It's where the money comes from. That's a good question, Dan. Well, it's a decision that somebody makes. It's yeah. not that simple, okay? If there's a decision made, there, and, and, and there's an action that takes place. Hey, Dan. Why is that? Dan, so Jason December may be able to speak on that. I, again, I have a little bit of tunnel vision only on my side of the bridge, so I don't exactly know everything that's going on on the other side. He may have some history and know uh, what was going yeah. on. So on the Keenan's County side, it's not the state police that's sitting at those ramps. It's the Keenan's County Sheriff. Uh, and uh, in full transparency, there's just some, uh, I believe, debate between the agencies on whether that's the right approach and whether that's even um, appropriate or legal. To, to stop someone to ask them for their identification before any violations occur. Um, but the Penis County Sheriff obviously embedded that, determined that to be uh, okay, and the state police has a different uh, mindset from my understanding, but it's two different agencies. It's not the state police and that's not the bridge. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so, so I'm thinking about these lights that you rented and put at the end of the ramps. That two and a half hour wait that they had, that was in front of all of our homes that these people right. were blocking us Agreed. For, for that period of time. Agreed. And that's not a solution. Right. It's, it's, I don't care if you have a, one of those lights at every single ramp, right. it's not a solution. It's not, it's, not even, it's not even a good thought. But the idea yeah. is to build it as a deterrent, but two weeks. For who? But two weeks is not a deterrent. Right. right. Well, and, and especially as this gentleman Saturday, said, every weekend, it's, it's different people. Right. Especially on a Saturday. I, I was going to say with your data, Fridays. Thursdays and Fridays could be Saturdays. some commuters Fridays involved. Fridays are people that go to the beach a lot of weekends. Mm -hmm. They rent a house there, but they're there a lot of weekends. Nobody who rents a house goes on Saturday every weekend. Mm -hmm. So the repeats are more on Friday. So I, I wonder if the data is always broken down that way, which shows something different from the repeat people versus the, the one that's in a month people. That's a good point. Well, I, I've been here 31 years. My daughter has therapy every Saturday uh, on, Cop on Ritchie Highway. I live here in the Cape. It, it takes me about, I don't know, 10 minutes to get there. And it takes me about 45 minutes to try to maneuver my way through that neighborhood over my church road to get to back to my house in Cape St. Clair because of all that beach traffic. Yeah, I mean, you know you're going to subject us to the same thing that you're subjecting the people who are diverting. Exactly. But, yes, but, exactly. but the point is to try and prevent people from diverting, you have to build some kind of a deterrent. So if enough word gets out after enough weekends, the question is, will that deter people from wanting to get on the side roads so our communities who live here will be better? Gentleman in the back. Yes, sir. I, I, I want to ask you a question about the question that you've gotten an opinion from as to why you can't close the ramps. You said uh, that you can't close the ramps and uh, reserve the roads only for certain people. The question I want to know is have you asked whether or not the ramps can be closed at certain times for traffic management? purposes, close to everybody, so that none of us could use those ramps during those particular times. When you have severe traffic on weekends, for example, no one gets on from point A to point B. Not just, um, not just uh, identifying people, but simply no one would be able to get on the ramps at all. I understand um, your question. Okay. And, and, and so and the question, the other, question, the, other, oh. the, other, the other thing I would like to suggest uh, since I may be difficult to get on again. Sure. Uh, the other thing I'd like to suggest is if you want to develop a deterrent, uh, as we were just talking about, perhaps what you need to do is to do that kind of uh, traffic metering every weekend beginning 
maybe around February, so that everybody knows it's there. Uh, and then uh, you have it, you know, that everyone would understand that that's how it's going to be. Uh, and then you have it as a, a, a regular practice, and people would know enough to sort of stay away from those uh, from those rooms. Like maybe average travel time for the access road is two hours and ten minutes, and the bridge average time is like 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. So your first question, um, and I'll read to you from the, the letter, the Federal Highway's answer. So they said, and I understand that Jim, our secretary, may have shared this already at the Bragg meeting. Um, Federal Highway says back to our Secretary of Transportation, we received your letter dated September 2nd, 2022, requesting FHWA's determination regarding allowing MDOT to restrict public access on state routes or ramps and limit access to local residents only. And so it asked question. both. That's not the question. Let well, let me finish. So, so, so it's both. So you said just limiting it, but it was both. It was your question, okay, regarding allowing MDOT to restrict public access on the state routes or ramps, restrict access on the ramps. And you also asked about limiting access to local residents only. So it was both. What, I, I guess, and this is really a, an important issue. What question did you ask the federal authorities? Did you ask, did you ask limiting to local residents only, or did you ask about we can't close them at certain times? My understanding is that is the wording. I mean, this is, they're reiterating what our wording yeah, is. Yeah, that, that's the problem. The problem is the question you asked, you, you wanted to get a specific answer to, and you got the answer you wanted. You can't close the ramps because you're talking about local residents only. But if you're talking about closing the ramps for traffic management purposes, that's a very different question. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, Patrick Ford, I've been here from 1970. Uh, I'm not going to see his kid going there. Uh, sounds good that uh, they probably should do roundabouts on East and West College Parkway to delay the Route 50 traffic because a lot of them go off go down the side roads. And if you had roundabouts that would delay them, they would stay on 50 to do their homework to go home. So, been here for years and never had problems before. <coughs> and, and maybe put some bike trails in on the side. I'm just getting to talk yeah. to you. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm Barbara Hitchings and a member of the Bragg Group, and I'd like to answer the man's question Thank you. about closing the ramp temporarily. Uh, back at our April meeting, I made that proposal that the ramps be closed yes. on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 10 o'clock until 4 o'clock, or an hour set by the state. And no given answer, no answer was given to us because they had to check the legality. And at last week's meeting, they checked the legality, and according to the attorney's office, we could not do that because, again, federal funding, et cetera. And my other proposal, which I did not put on the floor at that time, was the only way transportation code could be changed would be by the General Assembly. So we would have to ask our delegate, <coughs> delegates, excuse right. me, and our senator to put keeping, a bill like maybe just kind into of the General Assembly for the Transportation Code to be changed. Right. And that's where we stand at this point. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Friday, Friday, most of the city of Reynolds are from Saturday. B-R-I-T-G. B-R-I-T-G. I think it was Britt Griswold had a question? Yes, sir. Hold on a second. Um, okay, so what it sounds like to me is basically traffic okay. and people are water. So it doesn't matter whether you put roundabouts or swerve lanes or anything, as long as the people on the side are not hurting as bad as the people on the main road, the sides are going to fill up. It's just water. Yeah. And so the question comes down to then what amounts to closing mm -hmm. those exits to make the 
service roads, basically service roads, not travel roads, permanently, taking those last few exit out, exits out. And so if people want to get on 50 to go east, they've got to come back up to the west instead. Even but us. Even you. Yeah. That's the only way anything is going to improve. You, you, if I, I was very enamored with the one lane idea, but now that I'm hearing, if it, if it doesn't matter if it's one lane or not, mm -hmm. if the traffic still flows a little faster on those side roads, you're even, you know, and gonna Waze is going to send them down and send them around until they get on and save 10 minutes. Yeah. So um, until they can't get on to get on to go over the Bay Bridge, if they can't get on those side roads to get on, that's the only thing that's going to stop. Gentleman in the back. Sorry, I just have a quick question. So, and I'm just going to beat that horse, but closing ramps can't do it, but we can limit on ramps to, to control traffic congestion. Is there a way to limit access? Say, for example, if the main 50 is going slower than the off ramp, the ramp closes until the 50 gets faster. So it's not permanently closing, it's just, I know some freeways do that with access and stuff. If the 50, I grew up in Arizona, they did it all the time. If, if it was a one on one out there, if it went slower than the on ramp, they would keep them shut until the flow got faster so congestion would naturally clear up. Or is that going to fall into the same thing as permanently closing? Which I think I just don't know. That's a good question. I'd be more interested in hearing more about what you said they were doing in Arizona. Yes, ma'am. Um, in the back, yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering if the people that are working on these studies are aware that most of us who live on the roads off that come onto the service roads, we don't have any other way in or out. We don't have crossroads between us. So once that traffic is built up, we don't go home at all or get out at all. So I just hope that that's being reflected in the work. Yes, ma'am. This problem of your creation has been for decades an issue. And the main thing is the, the, we don't need more spans on the bridge. They haven't even properly corrected the infrastructure on the first old span. We need another bridge ferry, something south or north of here. It's, it's just a growing problem that it's like putting a Band-Aid on a bullet. And it just continues, you know, next year we'll see, the, it, it's the same problem that we've been dealing with for decades. They need another, <laughs> another bridge, a ferry system, or something else one. south sure. or north of here. And they've been talking about that since, since we had one span of the bridge. I'd like to take that one on because I've worked on that for probably five years. Uh, Bill Neville, who is a member of our Broadneck Council team, and I have called on every county executive, state senator, delegate, our, our, you name it, we've been in everyone's office, asking the same thing. Why don't we build a bridge away from this number seven corridor, which is Broadneck? And you can think of all the reasons, yes, but in meetings with Jim Port, the Secretary of Transportation, what came up when we thought we were getting close to getting that decision made was that the old 52 two-lane inadequate bridge that carries the bulk of the traffic over to the eastern shore is 20 years over its lifespan. We don't have a lot of money to tap into. Therefore, it, the, the estimate on a new bridge is going to be 20 billion or more. Many of us have been involved in studies and meetings with, I, I have spent more time with the uh, transportation Speaking division, of excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm not finished, with the transportation division on trying to find problems. Money is the main problem. So now that we have a bridge that's inadequate, that has to be upgraded, that takes priority over a bridge down south, because what are you going to do about the traffic that's going over the bridge now? It's dangerous once it's over, and uh, the LCCA study that many of us were involved in, uh, that, that had initially covered till 2065. They have since clarified it and said, these bridges cannot sustain them, the, the, the um, uh, burden of the traffic beyond 2040. 2040 is not that far away. It will take 15 years to build a bridge. 
We have to take care of the bridge we have now that is the main corridor over to the eastern shore. Are we going to try to get money? Let's say higher tolls. When Hogan I'm came into office, I'm not the, when Hogan came into concern. office, our, what were the tolls? Ten dollars. Hogan reduced the tolls to two fifty. It was very nice for travelers, but that's not paying the bills and not giving us the money we need to build up to a fund to pay for a twenty billion dollar. Pardon me. That was supposed to go to uh, education and to help oh, well, with. Well, we're into a whole other. Pat, I was at your meet at that meeting when Jim explained that, and basically what he said is he would be happy to build another bridge someplace right. else, but they have one pool of money. When that money goes to that other bridge, what are we going to do when this bridge that we're dealing with starts falling apart and they don't have any money for it? I mean, we have to think about it. You're welcome. We have to think about it logically. So we don't really have a choice. It just think this has been such a problem for well years. over. I've been here 31 years, decades. Decades. so I, I'm aware. Uh, we have a new governor coming in. Maybe he will decide that we're going to put money towards and raise the tolls. We don't know. But right now, we don't have the money to build a bridge north, south, as well as repair. Yes, sir. Oh. Delegate. Yes. Delegate Saab? Did you have? I'm Delegate Saab. So, Barbara, I'm, I'm actually going to ask you to stand up and talk about what you're doing. Yes, sir. Thank you. 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 I'm happy to do it. I will do it this first session. As we go in January, I will put in a bill that would allow us to close it. Because that is an important issue that you know, we've been going Some back people are finally forth. looking Attorney at the back. General, I can't <laughs> really advice in the letter that we can't close it. But if there's a legislative fix for it, I pledge today that I'm happy to do it the first session that I'm, that I'm in. Because I think that would really so help. So we'll spend hours getting out of our neighborhoods around here. No, no, I understand. I've, I've driven, you know, it's one way in, one way out. And once you make a left on any of these roads, you have to get Marshall, do you have any it's, questions it's, it's or do you want to move here to I, I, just, just just a couple more? I've spent a lot of time up that way. Uh, friends, I've been campaigning up that way, so I, I know exactly uh, what you feel. But we will definitely work with you, Barbara, to see if, you know, who told you and how we can do it so we can craft legislation that would pass in, in, in the first session. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. You've been very patient. <laughs> yes, sir. People coming down 50 are doing 65, sometimes, and mm -hmm. most times 75, 80 miles an hour. <laughs> they're coming in, they're coming in in 50, they're coming in the side roads, and they're backing up to try and get across the bridge. And the bridge, as I, I believe, is 40 mile an hour speed limit on the bridge. So you're going to have backup. There's no way it's not going to happen when there's the, <coughs> the divergence of the speed limit. So you're going to have that backup. So, and, and I know there's questions about safety, but two things, is there, are there techniques whenever there are accidents on the bridge to clear them as fast as possible to not have backups, one. And two, can you adjust the speed limits on the bridge? You know, it's 40 miles an hour, I, just in my personal experience, which is limit. Uh, people are doing 50 miles an hour anyway, it's hard I think for the police to police that unless there's automated, you know, things to keep it down to 40 miles an hour. But when there's congestion between 10 and 3, can they adjust the price the speed limit to 40 to 50 miles an hour so traffic can flow more quickly? You get more through. There's less backup. Well, I can tell you. And so I can tell you that when traffic gets reaching its the capacity of the road and then ultimately super saturated and above capacity of the road raising the speed limit doesn't help i mean the speed limit is 65 on i-97 but you still get backed up going uphill all the way up to benfield right yeah. so you have trucks you, they're sluggish it's hard for that so you're going uphill up onto the bay bridge heavy vehicles and things when, once you have a lot of traffic uh, I, I would just say that the speed limit in and of itself isn't the real issue <laughs> You may feel sluggish when there's not much traffic out there, and I could be doing 65, but I'm stuck behind a truck that's doing 40. But when it's really congested, it's going to break down and, and be slow and sluggish, no matter what that black and white sign says. So that's not really going to help. But I, you know, MDTA that operates the toll facility, um, 
they have their own folks and our chart folks that go out there and help them on the Bay Bridge and things. Um, they're, they're like nationally, even internationally known for how we handle our incidents and our incident response. And I'm sure Jason can speak much more intelligently about it than I can. He runs the show uh, for State Highway. But they, that is a big goal and a big thing that they do, trying to clear those incidents as quickly as possible. We know on our State Highway system, and so does the toll facility know on, their, on the bridge, the faster we can get things moved over to a shoulder or get it back open, and the faster we can get things underway. So that has been a major goal ever since the beginning of Reach the Beach and our whole chart division. You know. two, two thoughts. One is, you know, I don't like to go over the bridge at uh, 50 miles an hour next to a trailer truck that's mm -hmm. going <laughs> But one thought would be as they do, to divert, you know, when you have three lanes open, to divert the uh, trucks to the single lane, lane uh, so that the two lanes can, you could adjust the speed limit at that on those lanes to move faster to help clear the traffic or, or slow down the weight to get mm -hmm. across the bridge. Okay. I appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just want to clarify, please. Um, I appreciate all the work you've done, um, but there is nothing I'm hearing that would suggest that anything has changed and that the one way on East College Parkway has not been ruled out. It is still on the table. Am I correct? It has not been ruled out. We did not pursue something like that and vet it further or really analyze it further to see where or how we would break up the segments or anything like that. We haven't really made any progress on that. We just heard sort of a resounding no from folks that they didn't seem like that was something they wanted us to pursue. So in honesty, you know, we just kind of got all wrapped up in let's try this pilot and all the data and everything that we've been busily collecting through the summer. That was our focus this summer. So we didn't really have a lot of other irons in the, in the fire. What you said about didn't want us to pursue, what was that? From the survey, yeah. that option number three, where it mentioned, you know, maybe possibly one-way segments, and it was like 75% of the people who answered the survey said, no, don't do that. Um, so you are not pursuing So I didn't say that we totally ruled it out, but I'm saying we didn't, make progress on that this summer. That's just not something that we analyzed further or tried to, you know, a lot of people had questions like, well, what do you mean? What, which segment, which one? Sure. But we didn't actually analyze that any further or come up with any real concrete ideas or plans because it just seemed like the public didn't really want us to pursue that right now. They all wanted us to kind of try something like this. And so that's what we got wrapped up okay. in. Okay. Yes. Um, I just wanted to be sure that you were not looking for data or somebody wasn't looking for data to rule out this option about especially about the um, temporary ramp uh, mm -hmm. that that's not true you, you not, only have a limited time right way, way, varying know. data right and so we we just we just implemented it and studied it and now we're still in the midst of trying to see what we can glean from it and, and what kind of sense we can make out of it for moving forward Yes, sir. Going back to that question, you haven't ruled out the one way on East College Parkway, uh, but that's not your main goal at this time. You're not pursuing that. Is that correct? correct. We have not made any more progress on a plan like that. Right. Okay, because I was going to discuss that. Okay. Okay. And uh, serious issues with that. But I will confer that I, every Friday night I come back from Bowie around 4.30. Mm -hmm. And what you said was absolutely correct. If there's only two lanes going across, it backed up, or if there was an accident, mm -hmm. it backed up. Uh, I have not had serious problems on Friday night coming unless those are the situations. And you're right, I can get down to 15, 20 miles an hour, but at least I'm still moving. Mm -hmm. um, but this one-way thing, you cause serious issues to a number of people in the community on East College Parkway. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. May I say yeah. something? Uh, yeah. Maybe take I, just I one just more. wanted to make a, 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 a comment here, and that is uh, it has amazed me the detail and the depth of study that state highways did on the surveys that uh, we submitted to Tim Smith 
on uh, 331. Um, a lot of times you submit surveys and, you know, they're not going to really focus on Not so with state highways. They have actually uh, lowered in priority the one-way um, both sides and focused on the things that, that our uh, membership has, has suggested. And I was astonished. I said, well, I thought you were going to talk about all these turnabouts and, and the uh, one-ways. And they said, that's not what your surveys ask for. So they're listening, which I think is terrific. Yeah, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I, was, um, I was pleased to hear, or I guess to, uh, the reference to the travel apps, the, the ways, the, the Google Maps, and their influence on, on the driver behavior. And I understand that other governments have actually contacted those app systems and requested that they do something about not recommending local access? We do. We do. We are in communication with them. But if a road is open to the public, they're going to show it as open. So for instance, if we have a turn restriction somewhere, a, regulate, a regulatory sign, then they won't route you that way because it's, it's not supposed to it's not supposed to allow it. Right. Um, it if, yeah. if they and know and that there's an... The communication thing, yeah. I guess, was my biggest concern when this whole thing came about. I knew locally it's been in the papers and, and, you know, and the, the council has published it on Facebook mm -hmm. and all, so we're aware of it. But, I, you know, the people from Washington, D.C. and Northern Virginia, Pennsylvania, I don't know if they had any idea this was happening. Right. And it would only be through those travel apps. Right. And if there's any way to influence that... Yeah. The other thing is that, and this is a local issue, not a state issue, I noticed that we reduced the speed limit on College Parkway from 50 to 40, mm -hmm. but a lot of the apps haven't picked up that reduced speed. Hmm. And so they're still assuming that you can go through there fast. Right, so College Parkway itself is a county road, right. and right. then East College Parkway, the service road, is actually a state right. road. But saying. yeah, that's interesting. Out to right. Things. Just one. It more. doesn't use the speed yes. limit. Councilwoman, it uses the traffic. If cars are moving does, at fifty, it does, well, it does some well. of them show. No, no, it speed. shows the speed limit. Yeah. yeah. Right. Saying it uses yeah. the and, speed and of so the cars. So when you're going, you say, "Oh, it's fifty miles per hour. It's going to be a faster route if the traffic." No, no. It judges by the car. the the algorithm works on the speed of the cars that are working on that road right then. Yeah. That's how it knows but that it, this it is three minutes faster than that. Obviously, it's not going to take you on a thirty mile per hour road. Well, well, if the cars are actually moving 30, right. Shorter, yeah. Right, agreed. So just to close, Councilman, you're asking. In 2016, when we gathered all the residents and the elected officials and state and county police for a meeting to talk about all these traffic problems, one of the uh, solutions that we came up with is we had Anne Arundel County Police who volunteered their time, they use overtime funds, they're not funded for, they, they man the Sandy Point State Park traffic problems and, and uh, they keep that road clear, East College Parkway, um, all summer. And uh, one of the things that they did, uh, I was working with them, is to put up the local, tra local, local traffic only signs and uh, also uh, we call the ways, uh, application and police actually call we had the chief of police call tell them they did not want them to recommend using our service roads because uh, of all the reasons you can think and they flatly refused they said we don't care what your traffic problems are we don't care what your ordinances are all we do is we look and see what is the fastest route and that's what we put out there and they refused to work with the county police so that was a big uh, yeah, Councilwoman, yes. Thank you. Uh, Amanda Fieber, Councilwoman for District 5 here. Um, just for point of information, the College Parkway speed limit was reduced, obviously, because we didn't have bike trails and pedestrian crosswalks over College Parkway for decades. But with the expansion of the Broadneck Trail and those pedestrian crosswalks and increases in accidents, it was really important to bring that speed down for the safety of everyone. But I do know that Nestor Flores with the Department of Public Works is in communication on a semi-regular basis with the Waze folks. So I will talk to him and make sure that he makes a point to note to the Waze folks 
that College Parkway has a reduced speed, and if there's anything that they can do on their end to recognize that, it should be done. It, it's not just waves. I mean, there are a number of different systems. You're correct, mm -hmm. yes. So, I, just, I don't know how that information gets put out there. Okay. There is contact within Good. the government agencies, um, but it's always a challenge. Jason, yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'll just speak to that too. I mean, I think it's important for, for the group to know um, that when it comes to the to the NAV apps, right, I mean, that is a true market disruption, if you will, like Griffin's in business terms, to, to traffic management. So this discussion is happening not just at this local level, because this problem is nationwide. You know, yours is, is you know, uh, deeply affected by this, but in the nation, not the only one having a similar issue. So these discussions are happening, you know, at the national multi-state coordination level, you know, with the Googles, with the Waze, you know, with Apple uh, of the world to try to figure out how to solve this problem, you know, but yet take into account their, their business model, which is if we can save people time, that's what we're going to do. So those conversations are happening, uh, including a way to try to push map updates, you know, to a single point that goes to all of these different companies instead of having to coordinate with each one individually. So I just want this group to know this conversations, you know, are happening uh, very aggressively, you know, as this technology has continued to kind of take over how people decide to consume their, their travel information. Thanks, Jason. You want to use your Should we now? wrap it up? No, I think people just kind of look through them. I think at this point, we're going to probably wrap it up. Mm -hmm. Take two more questions. Yep. Then? We'll just take two more questions, okay? Sure. Ma'am in the back. Can you tell us or whoever needs to say this, what does happen from here? From right. this point, there's been some things discussed. And uh, I mean, I'm intrigued with the one of, um, yes, we would have misery for a while, <coughs> but if we kept this thing going, the death we did, eventually people would get the idea they can't do it. I mean, we'd have to sacrifice to get something. Um, but anyway, <coughs> what, what is the process? What does happen? And so that's where kind of where we left it was that was our ideas moving forward was that we would try to expand this next summer. Obviously, we're hearing a lot of comments from a lot of you folks here tonight um, that felt the pain of sitting in two hours and 20 minutes to, to get over there. So um, initially, I, I'll be frank, initially I was told that a lot of you were happy that there was so much gridlock. I thought, I thought we were trying to get rid of the gridlock, but it was almost like almost gleeful that they had to sit in it too. I, I didn't get that part of it, but um, but I hear it from you folks that no, that's not what you're wanting to sign up for. <laughs> so we hear that. Um, we, we are looking at potentially trying to expand it next summer, but we will be going back and discussing this that. The, I mean, the only way it can, for those of us who are affected, the only way it's worth the sacrifice is if it continues. Because if it's only like, we're going to do it eight times next year, but then we're going to stop. If, if no, the it's people get their habits away. going, and they know what they can do. Right. It has to continue forever yeah. to work. Yeah. Because yeah. the apps will adapt all the time. Yeah. Plus, is there a way to show on a signboard if you go down Whitehall, it's an hour and 20 minutes. If you go down College Parkway, it's two hours and 10 minutes. Yeah. If you stay on Route 50, it's 46 minutes. Yeah. But that only works that if idea. it's true. Yeah. And it changes by the minute, right? I mean, I don't right know if we now, could tie, tie our signboards into a, 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 an app. But that is what folks are looking at in their app. I mean, in their app, it'll show you the preferred route, and then these other routes are gray. And it's like, well, you could choose this one. It takes this many minutes. You could I choose that one. make it up. You had real data right. that showed those times. Right. But what I'm saying is th there were a lot of people that were choosing, right, to get off on those diversion routes, even though the apps didn't recommend it. And that was okay. just their habit, right? And then so they got I'm stuck really in it. I'm a heavy app user. I usually go by it. The other morning, I didn't. I, it told me to go right on Skidmore instead of left on Whitehall to go to mm -hmm. Annapolis. Mm -hmm. And I didn't listen to it. <laughs> and I effed up big time. Because yeah. it knew. It knew. People make decisions, right. snap, oh, come, right. come on, that can't possibly be faster. Or, hey, every time I've tried this in the past, it's been faster. Right. So they, they go by those habits. Uh, there was somebody, whoever was, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. This is just a foolish idea that I'm going to throw out. The problem is there is way too much traffic during certain periods of time. Right. If you change the toll process 
at the bridge at different times could have potentially educate the people not to go during the peak periods and therefore average it out. And, and you know, maybe make a little bit of change, but it might make a difference, you know. Because it's the peak times. There's lots of studies on that. Yeah. What, so you mean charge more at certain hours? Mm -hmm. Right. Peak hour pricing. Maybe, Based on conditions. You know, yeah. It's a good comment. balance it out. Thank you. We brought that forward for years. Yeah. And we've been turned down every time we brought it forward. Oh, so they don't want to change the... They just said it won't, it won't work. But we'll, we'll keep adding it to the list. And with each you know, new, we have a new, we have a new Secretary of Transportation now. We'll bring it up, all these things that you brought forward, we will bring it up and uh, meet with Jim Ports and, and Tim and uh, Will and talk about all, all these issues. And, and uh, by the way, the, there is nobody who sits in an office in MDOT who knows that the Broadneck Peninsula is happy about the crowd of traffic that we deal with in summer months. So please, uh, that was sort of, uh, uh, I think, misstated. Everybody we speak to, and we spend a lot of time with these executives, and they know how bad it is here. And they read your letters and your emails. Actually, I found the winter worse because of when I hit parole, near parole, it backs up far worse than it does in the summer, when I'm coming down 50 on, on Friday nights. That's the rough of the seven Yes, yes. It's, it's actually worse than when I get over the seven rings of flying. Okay, we got it. Before everybody leaves, I'm sure, I just want to make sure that everybody's aware that um, the Broadneck Peninsula is actually Fred, you want to talk? It's posted on our website. Two days. Two days. Two days. Yeah. Two days. Yeah. We've been putting out messages about that for the past couple days. To see information from the Broadneck Council. Favorite crossing study. Get on there, answer their questions, give them a good long comment about what you think needs to be included in a Bay Bridge and access to the Bay Bridge. I haven't seen that email. It's Bay Cross study. So I want to thank you all, and I appreciate certainly all the questions.